Order members, and we now move to question time and questions to uh, OFM DFM. And the first minister will be uh, taking question time. I call Miss Anna Lowe. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question number one, please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And since the Minority Ethnic Development Fund was introduced, it has supported hundreds of projects and groups, and has been a key contributor to our growing and vibrant sector. Our support will continue into 2016-17 and beyond. There will be a call for applications to the 2016-17 Minority Ethnic Development Fund once all obligatory governance requirements have been met. We are aware that there is a desire for a seamless transition from one funding round to the next, and we will work to ensure that there is no hiatus. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the Minister, First Minister. Uh, for her statement. Um, I'm sure she's aware in the last few occasions uh, the funding process uh, went very late in the day and decisions were not made until May or June, causing a lot of uncertainties in the ethnic minority sector. Um, can I ask the Minister exactly when the funding application will be open and would it not be sensible for uh, the current uh, funding to be extended to cover next year for all the uh, organisations now receiving funding. Well, I thank the member for her question, and uh, I share her um, concern about last year. But I think we all know that last year was a little bit different. Uh, we had difficulties in and around the budget settlement, uh, and indeed very many other difficulties as well. Um, so I think that this year we are very focused on the fact that uh, a new funding round will be available, and indeed the budget has been set uh, for 16-17. And now it's a case of working with the various groups of which. There are many, actually, and I was interested to see the number of groups uh, involved right across the province um, to make sure that there is no gap between this year and next year. Uh, I know last year that they did have to wait uh, until, I think it was May, June time, and then had to look for back payment and what have you, and we were hoping that this year that that will not be the case. Dr. Mike Nesbitt. Speaker, thank you. Um, refugees and asylum seekers uh, arriving in England, Scotland, Wales, and the Republic of Ireland can, I understand, access uh, psychologists and psychiatrists with the special skills necessary for treating people who have been subjected uh, to long-term torture. Can the Minister assure the House that refugees coming here have access uh, to the same services? And if not, uh, do the incoming Syrians know that that is the situation? Well, as he will know, the refugees that come uh, and have arrived here, and uh, I was very pleased to meet, along with the Deputy First Minister, that first group of 51 uh, refugees that came uh, to Northern Ireland just before Christmas. 51 refugees, uh, 11 of them children, some of them very, very young. Uh, and uh, they were delighted to be in Belfast. And I have to say, uh, I was very proud of our team of officials from right across government and the way in which uh, they had prepared uh, for these good people coming to Belfast uh, and indeed we have been commended uh, by the Home Office for the way in which we welcomed the people uh, into Belfast and into Northern Ireland. So they have uh, full access uh, to the National Health Service and they will, if they have any needs, be accommodated because uh, we are making sure that we stay very close uh, to the group that are here uh, and uh, we're looking forward to helping them to integrate into Northern Ireland society. And uh, as I say, uh, Mr. Speaker, we're very proud of the work that has been carried out to date. Mr. Gordon Lyons. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Speaker. And can I very warmly congratulate the First Minister on her appointment yeah. and, uh, and, and wish her well as she answers what I believe will be the first of many, many question times uh, as First Minister. Could the uh, First Minister uh, provide some more detail as to who is administering the 15-16 round of the crisis fund? Yes, well, the public procurement process has been completed, and uh, I'm pleased to say that the Red Cross has been uh, selected uh, to administer the 2015-16 crisis fund. That's a, they have a £100,000 budget, and uh, they will continue to deliver on what really was excellent and vital work which was carried out uh, last year. Um, I, I think it is good that the Red Cross have been successful in respect of this uh, procurement because they of course work right across 
Northern Ireland. They're able to give that um, province-wide uh, support uh, to groups that may, and indeed individuals who may need to access uh, the crisis fund. So again, the broad geographical uh, coverage is very, very good, and we're delighted that they will deliver that £100,000 budget across Northern Ireland. I call Ms. Bronwyn McGahan. And can I too take the opportunity to, to wish the Minister good luck in your new role? Can I ask the Minister when will the racial equality subgroup be established and what is its role? Well, as the member will know, and I thank her for her good wishes, as the member will know, we have now agreed the racial uh, equality strategy, and uh, that was agreed just before Christmas. And uh, I know it was a long-awaited strategy, but we're very pleased that it's now in place, and we're hoping that the subgroup will meet in the near future to take forward that strategy. And indeed, we're also looking at a refugee integration strategy as part of that racial equality strategy, because that will sit alongside the racial equality strategy. Speaker, question number two. Uh, following the recent judicial ruling, we are working to address the concerns of the court by developing a strategy to tackle poverty, social exclusion, and patterns of deprivation based on objective need. Significant actions have been taken forward to address poverty, social exclusion, and deprivation. Through the Executive's Delivering Social Change programme, we have committed over £100 million. We have added a further £2 million from OFMDFM to projects jointly funded with Atlantic Philanthropies, in total uh, worth almost £60 million for over four years. This work has focused strategically on improving outcomes across a range of measures, including health, uh, education and developing the economy. Claire Hanna for supplement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and can I add my congratulations to the First Minister? It's a, it's a very exciting appointment for Northern Ireland, and certainly uh, wish you very well. Um, and I know uh, having a strategy isn't a silver bullet. We have a child poverty strategy, but the Institute of Fiscal Studies say that child poverty is on the increase here. But can you confirm if there will be um, a specific and coherent anti-poverty strategy produced as part of the next programme for government? Well, I can. Indeed, we have decided not to uh, appeal the judgment from uh, court, and therefore we intend to bring together a strategy. Um, it was, I suppose, uh, a rather technical judgment insofar as the court accepted that there were very many actions uh, that have been undertaken to deal uh, with poverty and, and exclusion across Northern Ireland. Uh, but as she has said, there, there just wasn't a strategy as such which brought everything together. So uh, there's a piece of work going on now to uh, make sure that the strategy will be in place, and we hope to have that in place in the near future. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, can I congratulate the First Minister on what I feel will be first of many question times? Can I ask the First Minister to give us some detail as to what actions have been taken to tackle poverty overall? Well, as I indicated uh, in my, my first answer, I, I, a lot of good work has been taking place, and that was acknowledged uh, by the judge in relation uh, to what he had to say uh, about uh, the strategy. Uh, the Social Investment Fund uh, is committed to projects with associated costs of around £58 million, uh, profiled over a number of years, and so that is really beginning to ramp up now in terms of making a difference. Uh, we have a £26 million package in terms of six new delivering social change signature projects, including a very uh, impact of uh, additional teachers programme. As you know, uh, there were identified in relation to literacy and numeracy, um, and uh, that made a huge difference huge difference in society and it was only running uh, for two years however uh, it's something that perhaps we need to look at uh, again uh, we rolled out nurture units to help uh, support social emotional and behavior development of our young children we had an extended schools program so a lot has been happening over this past four to five years in terms of trying to deal with very real difficulties in our society. Uh, and uh, I think we should, uh, sometimes we look for strategies, we look to make sure that we have a strategy in place. But on this occasion, we have a lot of actions that have been there to show that work has been ongoing. Come, Ms. Rosie McCorley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answers thus far. And uh, can I also wish uh, the Minister well in her future role, in her new role for the future? Sorry. Um, August, uh, on Jiglum, Ear, Erin, Ira, Ken, Ober, Filahar, 
um, a ta a ta or shul at the Gullen Lakla Bucktonus August Jihak Lani. Um, the minister mentioned child poverty, so can I ask her? Um, can she specifically outline what work is under is is planned for to tackle child poverty and child deprivation? Well, we've commissioned, and I thank the, the member for her, her comments in relation uh, to my appointment. Um, we've commissioned research uh, and indeed engaged with a wide range of stakeholders in relation to the new uh, child poverty strategy, uh, 14 uh, 17, based on an outcomes based approach. And this is uh, something that we're trying to embed within <coughs> government, uh, right across government, actually, and it's something that we're looking at for the new programme for government, so that we're looking at actually the outcomes that we can achieve as opposed to how we get there. And then once we work out what we want to see happening, then we all work together to deliver uh, on those outcomes. And I think uh, no better place to start than with uh, child poverty, because we want to really try and eradicate child poverty in a way that up until now we haven't been able to do. Thank you. And I'll come to George Robinson. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, Mr. Speaker, at the outset, can I welcome the First Minister to her first question time and ask her to answer question three, please? Under the agreed departmental restructuring plan, policy and funding for victims and survivors, including sponsorship and oversight of the Victims and Survivors Service and the Commission for Victims and Survivors, which is currently with our department, shall not be transferred but is to remain within the remit of the new Executive Office. As such, we do not anticipate that there will be any negative impact on services for victims and survivors. Indeed, we believe that there will be a continued focus on the collaborative design programme, which will bring further improvements to services for victims and survivors. Mr. Robinson, for supplementary. Thank the Minister for her answer. And would the First Minister support calls to ensure there is no budget reduction to the Victims and Survivors Service? I thank the member for his question and indeed for his good wishes as well. Um, the funding for 2015-16, the current uh, budgetary year that we are in, has been increased uh, with over £14 million being provided to support the victim sector. And that is the highest ever opening budget uh, that we have had uh, for victims right across Northern Ireland. And certainly, uh, I have consistently fought uh, to protect uh, the victims' issues and victims' budgets, and I will continue uh, to do that uh, within this department. Uh, I believe that it is something uh, that we will be proactive in, certainly in the coming year and in the years to come. So, sir, From my perspective, uh, funding for victims and survivors will continue to be a priority for the new Executive Office if I am returned as First Minister. I call Mr John Dallet. Mr Speaker, I thank the Minister for her answer and also wish her all the best for the future. Uh, the Minister, of course, has personal experience of the past. Does she agree with me that there needs to be a new synergy and a new energy to represent the needs of victims and survivors? And in particular, does it amaze her that Scapatici, alias uh, steak knife, has never been questioned about the crimes that he allegedly committed? Well, first of all, let me thank the member for his good wishes on my appointment. Um, as far as I'm concerned, uh, as regards the Office of First Minister and Deputy First Minister, the issues of victims is certainly one that will continue to be to the fore. Uh, in relation to the very specific issue he's uh, spoken about, as I understand that there have been directions given in relation to that matter now. Uh, and I think it underlines uh, the issue uh, of uh, funding to deal with those legacy cases, particularly for the Police Service of Northern Ireland when they are directed to uh, become involved in a historic case, then it is only right, from my perspective, that they should have the funding to deal with that particular case. Otherwise, they will have to take funding um, from other areas of their budget. And of course, I don't think anybody would want to see that happening. So I think that's an ongoing issue that we need to discuss uh, with uh, our own government in relation to funding, because as he knows, uh, the, the money that was set aside uh, for dealing with the past, the £150 million, has not been uh, drawn down because that issue still remains in abeyance. Uh, and I think we really do have to get real. If, if, if the police are being ordered to do particular issues, uh, then they should have the funding that comes with that. And comes to Chris Little. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I congratulate the First Minister on her appointment and wish her well for the future. I could ask the First Minister how disappointed she is that the Fresh Start deal failed to deliver uh, a comprehensive framework on uh, legacy issues for victims and survivors in Northern Ireland. I thank the, the member uh, for his question, and I think many of us, indeed probably all of us, were disappointed that we weren't able to have an agreement in relation to the legacy issues. I mean, I have to say, great work has been carried out. Uh, we were very, very close to having a comprehensive agreement on dealing with the past, uh, and that's why I think it's important to continue to engage. Uh, with our own government, with the government of the Republic of Ireland, and most importantly with the victim sector as well, uh, to try and move this issue forward. But in doing so, we have to be honest uh, and open about the chances of doing that at a particular time. And I've been asked the question, do I think that this will be sorted before uh, our, our next election? And I have to be honest with victims and say I think that this is not going to happen uh, before the next election because uh, there's an election coming in the Republic of Ireland. We have an election in May, uh, and I just don't think that we're going to be able to deal with those issues in the short time scale that we have. And call Mr. Danny Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I join with others and congratulate the First Minister on her uh, recent elevation and wish her well? Uh, would the Minister agree with me that it is, uh, it is essential that the Executive and Assembly deliver real tangible benefits for victims uh, and counter any attempts to rewrite the history of the Troubles? I uh, thank the member for his, his welcome. Uh, and indeed, I, I share with him a concern that there are some. Uh, engaged in trying to write a particular narrative about what happened here uh, and indeed right across the island uh, over this past 30 to 40 years. Some are trying to rewrite what happened uh, in 1916, for goodness sake, uh, so we shouldn't be surprised uh, around all of that. However, uh, I will assure him that I will resist any attempt to rewrite what happened in the past. Thank you. And I call Mr Sammy Douglas. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I also uh, welcome the First Minister uh, to this uh, question time and uh, long may she reign. Sure. <laughs> uh, question number four, please. Um, Mr. Speaker, with your permission, I will ask Junior Minister Emma Pengeli to answer this question. A dedicated team has been established to take forward the development of design plans for the urban village projects and the implementation and completion of capital build. Local coordinators have already been appointed in four of the urban village areas and recruitment is underway to identify a suitable candidate for the Fountain and Bogside urban village. The local coordinators are actively engaging with communities and stakeholders. £1.79 million worth of capital has been allocated to projects within the urban village areas with a further £1.7 million revenue committed to the delivery of the programme this financial year. I call Mr. Douglas for a supplement. I'd like to thank the, the junior minister for her response <coughs> so far. And I suppose all politics is local. So could she give us a, an update on developments on the Newton Arge Road, please? Yes. Um, as the member will be aware, I am greatly enthusiastic about the Urban Village Initiative. I do think there is huge potential with it to really transform communities and that is about top to toe uh, transformation particularly focusing in relation to capital and, and tackling dereliction and the long-standing problem perhaps of, of key areas where they've been outstanding for perhaps decades uh, if not in recent years so absolutely the uh, I'm pleased to say that the uh, East Belfast urban village that has been renamed Lower East Side is progressing very very well he will be aware of a number of consultations and community events in terms of trying to identify the actions required for the local area and we are optimistic that um, a draft plan which is already being drawn up will be in a position to be shared more widely in around March of this year. And comes Cahill could I also take the opportunity to wish the First Minister all the best. Cahargis as they say in Irish. Um, but could I ask the Junior Minister just to expand on how the department will work with the local councils in running out these urban programmes. 
Indeed, and with the proposed uh, transfer of regeneration functions to local councils, I think it is critical that the Office of First and Deputy First Minister, on behalf of the executive, because Urban Villages is a Northern Ireland executive programme, but that OFMDFM, on behalf of the Northern Ireland executive, does a very close contact with local councils. There are a range of powers that local councils have, for example, that will be very useful in terms of expediting the types of work that we want to see. Uh, we have already contacted um, and been in constant contact, in fact, with uh, both of the council areas that are impacted by the Urban Village 5 uh, projects. Uh, we have invited uh, representatives from both those councils to sit on our project management board, and uh, they came along, I think, just in the last couple of weeks to a meeting that I cha jointly chaired. And I think that input is invaluable, absolutely invaluable, and we will continue with that relationship as we progress with the development plans and into the delivery stage of urban villages. Thank you. And uh, I call Mr. Adrian Cochrane Wilson. Mr. Speaker, can I also uh, join with others in wishing First Minister Whale uh, question number five, please? And with your permission, uh, Mr. Speaker, I will ask Junior Minister Amber Pengelly to answer this question. Speaker. We are aware of the Inquiry Chairman's decision to conduct a targeted consultation. The full rationale is set out in his public announcement of 4 November 2015. The Historical Institutional Abuse Inquiry is independent from government, and this is a matter for the Inquiry Chairman to address. We cannot answer on his behalf. The Member may wish to write to the Inquiry Chairman seeking further information. We look forward to receiving the inquiry's report and recommendations in January 2017. However, I would highlight that the terms of reference make it clear that ultimately the nature and the level of any potential redress is a matter for the Northern Ireland Executive. Mr. Cochran, what's in for supplementary? Can I thank the junior minister for her response? But, however, you know, given that Sir Anthony Hart has now stated he is in favour of redress for victims of institutional abuse. Does the First Minister not accept that that makes it untenable not to introduce similar provision for the HIA for victims of non-institutional abuse who fall outside the remit of the current process? Well, as the member will be aware, there is a scoping uh, paper in relation to the options available in relation to those other matters. Uh, that paper uh, will go to the executive uh, just uh, this week, I understand. So we will wait the uh, outcome of that discussion. And the call, Mr. Edwin Put. Uh, Mr. Speaker, um, is the inquiry uh, currently operating within budget and is expected to be completed within budget? And secondly, um, in other jurisdictions where redress has been made to victims, it uh, more often has been the case than not that it has been the perpetrators of redress rather than the state that has actually paid that redress. And I assume that um, anything that is done will be looking at those who have actually been the perpetrators of the redress. I thank the member for his question. Uh, in relation to the budget for the uh, HIA inquiry, I'm very pleased to say that we did take an, uh, some time in the design of the inquiry to try to ensure that the focus of this inquiry would be on the needs of uh, the victims and survivors, and that this would not be an inquiry where, for example, huge legal bills would be the main story coming out of this. Uh, we also have, uh, as I have highlighted, an independent chairperson who has been very responsible in the management of that budget. And I am pleased to say that year on year the inquiry has come in just under the projected costs uh, as outlined. So the inquiry is being run efficiently, it is being run effectively. And in, in relation to the matter of redress, you are absolutely right. In terms of, for example, the uh, inquiry and redress process in the Republic of Ireland, there was a considerable contribution, for example, by the, the Roman Catholic Church. And those are all issues that would need to be considered uh, in due course, dependent on how the executive decide to move forward with this issue. Mr. Alban McGuinness. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the junior minister for her previous answers. Uh, Sir Anthony Hart has said that there should be financial redress, um, and it, it seems to me that, given the fact he has said that, and given the fact that some of this will ultimately lie with government, uh, would it not be right and proper uh, that government now uh, would scope out the nature of such financial redress uh, and be prepared for that uh, so as to prevent delay and frustration on the part of victims who deserve that redress? 
I thank the member for his question. And in preparation for the historical institutional abuse inquiry, <coughs> And in the project design, we did look at a range of other jurisdictions, not only in terms of the mechanisms around uh, these types of inquiries, but also the redress uh, mechanisms as well. And uh, therefore, we do have uh, some information in relation to that. I do think it would be preemptive for us to commence uh, scoping. As the chairman of the inquiry has highlighted, he is undertaking a consultation process, and I assume that the outcome of that consultation process, specifically in relation to redress, will be shared with us. So uh, I think it would be preemptive to commence that now. We will await that report and uh, make a decision in terms of uh, actions on the back of that. Mr. Stuart Dixon. Thank you. Uh, thank the junior minister for, her, for the answers that she's, she's brought to us so far. The junior minister, you, you made reference to the options paper for uh, non-institutional uh, abuse uh, um, aspects of this. Can you tell us when that options paper will be presented to the executive, and, and have you scoped out any costs involved in actually delivering that, that particular aspect of any future inquiry? Yes, my understanding is that uh, if that paper has already been circulated, if that is not the case, it is certainly due to be circulated very, very soon with the aim of that paper uh, getting to the executive at the next executive meeting. Uh, in relation to the costings, uh, there are set costs with inquiries, as the member will be aware, and we do have the costings for this inquiry. So, although it is, of course, dependent on the number of people that come forward, the set costs remain the same. So, actually, the number of people coming forward to inquiry is a small variable on the overall cost. So the cost is likely to be uh, in, in, in the millions, uh, possibly above 10 million for any new statutory inquiry, regardless of the numbers of people to come forward. However, that, that detailed work will take place after decisions are made. I would say that there are a range of issues in terms of the data and the information available for us uh, in relation to issues outside the scope of the current inquiry. And uh, one of the options highlighted in the paper is that more work would need to take place, perhaps by uh, some experts in relation to the scale of the issues to be tackled. Thank you. And I call Mr. Kieran McCarthy. Mr. Speaker, could I have question number six to the First Minister, please? The Department of Finance and Personnel is working with the Open Government Network to develop a contribution to the UK Open Government Action Plan. OFM, DFM officials are involved in this development process. Open Government principles have the potential to support the aims of the current reform agenda, in particular by supporting greater accountability of the executive for delivery of outcomes and by fostering greater collaboration across government and across sectors. These developments are therefore timely as we look forward to the restructuring of the executive departments and the transition to a more outcome-focused programme for government. Call Mr. McCarthy. I thank the First Minister for her reply and can I, like others, uh, offer my congratulations to Mrs Foster on her appointment as First Minister and wish her every success to ensure that Northern Ireland is a fair, just and prosperous society as we move forward. Uh, but as part of the uh, question, uh, will the First Minister commit to publishing the various departments' quarterly monitoring uh, uh, so that the implementation of the plan can be easily seen? Well, as I've indicated, uh, this plan to work with uh, Open Government, the organisation called Open Government, comes at a very good time um, because we are looking, and uh, in my previous department, DFP, it was something that I looked at just a few days before I left, how we were going to use this platform to continue the work that we've started in terms of restructuring government here. Uh, I think it's a great opportunity to talk about the things that have actually been of success uh, in Northern Ireland, including uh, digitalisation of a lot of our services right across government. Uh, we now have uh, uh, and access for people in their own homes in terms of services from government, and they can do that by digital means. And I think there's more that we could do in terms of open government, and I look forward very much to working with my colleague in DFP to make sure that we drive this uh, reform agenda uh, through the Open Government Partnership. John Lynch. Good to uh, call you. And again, I want to wish the member well in our new post. Can I ask the Minister what progress has been made in establishing the civic uh, panel? Well, as the member will know, the Stormont House Agreement envisaged 
uh, a new civic engagement model based on the establishment of a compact civil advisory, civic advisory panel, uh, and the uh, steps for the establishment of the panel were set out uh, in the Stormont Agreement and Implementation Plan, of course, the fresh start, uh, and it anticipates a panel of six people uh, being uh, established by the executive with members, including the chair, being identified uh, and appointed uh, by this department. Uh, it's expected that the panel will seek the views of a wide range of representatives and stakeholders. So whilst there's only going to be six people on the panel, they will uh, in turn go out right across civic society. And we're currently considering and indeed identifying uh, panel members for that very post. Thank you. And that brings us to the end of the period for listed questions. And we now move on to topical questions. And it comes to Fran McCann. Uh, Kieran Collier. And I also would like to join all our members in uh, congratulating uh, the, 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 for the elevation of the First Minister and wish her well um, on our, our, our job. But can I ask the Minister uh, to update us on the report that junior ministers undertook to examine the impact of Tory cuts on the community and voluntary sector? Well, as the member rightly identifies, uh, the junior ministers were tasked uh, by the executive uh, after we were alerted uh, to a, a difficulty uh, by NICFA and the wider voluntary community sector that there, there was a problem uh, developing whereby all of our departments were actually making uh, savings or cuts uh, in terms of the wider voluntary sector and they were actually uh, sustaining hits from right across the piece. So that piece of work was taken forward by the junior ministers and action plan uh, has been developed in conjunction uh, with NICFA and the wider uh, voluntary sector, and that action plan has been approved uh, by uh, the First Minister and Deputy First Minister's office, and it has now been sent around uh, our executive colleagues, and there have been some responses to that. And Mr McCann, for supplementary. I thank the First Minister uh, for, uh, for her response, and uh, I think we all know uh, the excellent work that is done by uh, the community and voluntary sector, many of it uh, could be life saving in areas of high deprivation. Are you confident that the action plans that are now uh, being discussed uh, will help and uh, see that these sectors come out the other end of the cuts that are taking place? Well, I am, and I think it's a very good uh, example of collaborative working, uh, if I can say that. A problem was identified. Uh, by NICFA, by the wider community sector, they came to government and instead of standing outside and complaining about the issue, they came to government and looked for a solution. Uh, and we have worked with them to try and provide them with a solution uh, through this action plan. I understand uh, that a wide range of ministers have uh, come back with comments in relation to the action plan, so I am hopeful that it will be a useful piece of work and a piece of work that uh, should be uh, an example of how we work with different sectors. If there is a very specific issue raised, then come forward. We will try and work with you and try and find a solution, and I think that that has worked on this occasion. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, could the uh, First Minister give us an update on the implement implementation of the Fresh Start Agreement? I thank the member for his uh, question. Uh, we have made very good progress in relation uh, to the implementation of the Fresh Start Agreement. Uh, the progress has actually, uh, in the interests of open government, been published on the OFMDFM uh, website. Uh, we met uh, with our own government on Strand 1 issues last week. We met with the Republic of Ireland government on Strand 2 uh, issues, and, uh, and we have shared um, the progress that has been made. So I am pleased to see the progress that has been made, and we will continue to push ahead and make sure that the Fresh Start Agreement is implemented. Thank the Minister, First Minister, for her answer. And could I ask the Minister specifically, does the First Minister believe that the budget, budget will put Northern Ireland on a stable financial footing? Well, uh, given my previous role, I would of course say yes. Um, <laughs> now that the, uh, the monitoring and indeed uh, the budget for next year uh, have been uh, agreed by the Northern Ireland Executive, uh, it means that we will meet our budget this year and indeed next year, uh, and with welfare reform, uh, dealt with and all of the other pressures that I stood here talking about in June of last year. I think we are on 
uh, a good route map now in terms of the budget and I look forward to the introduction, uh, I think it's tomorrow, Mr Speaker, uh, of the budget by my friend, the Minister for Finance and Personnel. And I call Mr Chris Little. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I ask the First Minister if the Office of First Minister and Deputy First Minister will match the UK Government commitment to deliver 30 hours free childcare for families in Northern Ireland rather than the 12 hours that I understand is currently available? Well, as the member will be only too aware, we have just finished the consultation in relation to the childcare strategy for OFM DFM. Um, that finished, I think, in and around the end of November. Uh, and we will continue to work our way through the responses to that consultation, uh, including any that make reference to uh, the Westminster government's proposals in relation to free childcare. And as he's also aware, uh, childcare is due to transfer to the Department of Education after the next election. Mr. Little, for a supplement. Thank the First Minister for her response. She will be aware that the cost of, of childcare for families in Northern Ireland continues to be a, a significant expenditure. So can I ask the First Minister when the full childcare strategy will be published uh, and whether that will include specific action plans uh, with clearly identified budget items and whether the executive will maintain the full level of funding for the Women's Centre Childcare Fund for 16-17? Uh, well, the Women's Sector Child Care Fund, correct me if I'm wrong, is a matter for the Department of Social Development, uh, I believe, and I know that it's something that the Minister is currently looking at because I had cause to speak to him about it uh, with regards to a women's centre in my own constituency. Um, but in terms of the child care strategy, it would certainly be our hope that that will be agreed before the end of this mandate. I think it would be right and proper to do that, particularly since uh, child care will transfer to the Department of Education um, under the new uh, arrangements for uh, leaner government. And I think it's right that it sits with the Department of Education. Uh, I, uh, as a working mum, have a particular interest uh, in childcare costs and in making sure that childcare is available uh, to all those who wish to be uh, in, uh, in, in work. And uh, therefore, it is a particular uh, policy that I take an issue or I take an interest in. So he can be assured that this is one that I want to see agreed before the end of this mandate. And call Mr. Alban McGuinness. Uh, thank you very much, um, Mr. Speaker. And could I take this opportunity of congratulating the First Minister for coming to office? And um, I, in, in all my dealings with her, particularly as chair of the Enterprise Trade and Investment Committee, she showed great professionalism and great courtesy, and I'm sure that will continue. Um, in relation to uh, the events of 1916, which will be uh, both commemorated and celebrated, depending on your uh, political point of view, here in Ireland, North and South, would the First Minister clarify her position? Would she uh, uh, agree to attend uh, commemorations or events surrounding the commemoration of the Easter Rise in 1916? Uh, in Dublin or elsewhere? Well, first of all, can I thank the member for his very kind comments in relation to my appointment to this office? And I suppose what starts as a, a new era for me uh, ends an era for him. And I do wish him well uh, in his retirement from office. He has served the constituents of North Belfast for a long time, and I wish him well uh, in his retirement. Uh, in terms of the issues surrounding uh, Easter 1916, I was asked a very specific question uh, by one of my local journalists as to whether I would attend uh, the commemorations uh, in Dublin and, uh, uh, for uh, that event, and I indicated that I would not. Uh, that is still my position. I have since then indicated, uh, on a wider perspective, that I am very aware uh, that the events that happened uh, in Dublin at Easter 1916 were part of a whole wider context of what was going on, uh, not only on this island, uh, but in these islands at that particular time, and indeed further afield. And I am more than content, in fact, I am looking forward uh, to attending um, lectures, symposiums, uh, discussions 
in and around the year that was in it in relation to 1916 and the whole context of what was going on at that particular time. So whilst I won't be uh, attending the official commemorations or indeed any other commemorations in relation to what happened in Dublin uh, in Easter 1916, I will of course be reflecting on everything else that took place in that year. Mr McGuinness for a supplement. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I, I thank the First Minister for her kind remarks. Um, I, I think her answer to my original question was a wee bit like the curate's egg, good in parts. Uh, but uh, could the, would the First Minister agree with me that uh, a proper analysis uh, and in-depth analysis historically of the events surrounding the Easter Rising and indeed uh, other events through 19, 1916 would be appropriately uh, visited by herself and indeed other ministers uh, and of, of different parties so that in fact people here both north and south may uh, derive some lessons from what happened in the past and indeed be educated in the actual history of those events. And uh, he'll be pleased to know that I agree with him. Uh, I do hope that we take the opportunity. And indeed, there are very many young people in Northern Ireland today who have no cognizance of what uh, we're talking about, frankly. They're more interested in what's going on in 2016 than what happened in 1916. And if we are to look backwards, that's all very good. And we should do that. And I will do that. I've already uh, taken up an invitation to attend uh, a Church of Ireland event in Christchurch in Dublin uh, in February of this year in terms of what was going on uh, in 1916 and I look forward to that very much. Uh, but I think our focus, as I said standing here last week when I accepted the nomination to be First Minister, should definitely be on the future for this place. We need to make sure that, and we've talked a lot about anti-poverty strategies, we've talked about child poverty strategies, we need to see action in terms of the young people who live here in Northern Ireland so that they are very proud of this place, just as I'm proud of this place. Um, I call Mr Paul Gibbon. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and can I welcome the First Minister to question time and wish her well uh, for the future. Uh, can I put on record my thanks uh, for uh, making Pond Park Primary School in Lisburn her first engagement as First Minister outside of this building. And uh, I know the school was very appreciative of the time that she spent. Uh, picking up on some of the themes that were raised during that visit, um, the school was inspected only last year and received the highest uh, grading possible of outstanding. Particularly mentioned was uh, its focus on ed educational underachievement. Um, could I ask the First Minister how important she values education going forward? Well, I thank the member for his question, and indeed I thank him for hosting me uh, down in Pond Park last week. I've uh, already uh, put the card up, which makes me look very thin. It's very good that I am perceived that way uh, by young people in Pond Park. It was a lovely event and a lovely occasion. And actually, I talked a lot last week about uh, hoping to inspire and to motivate uh, young people in terms of Northern Ireland and when I went to Palm Park the reverse happened they inspired me they were absolutely tremendous we listened to them singing we listened to what they were doing in class uh, and it was really a fabulous visit and all I want is for every child of the same opportunities as those children have uh, in Palm Park uh, and I know uh, my good friend and colleague the junior minister has taken this particular issue of educational uh, attainment under her wing and indeed has just recently written out to all of the schools across Northern Ireland to take their views in relation to issues around educational underachievement. And this is an issue that we intend to keep looking at because we really do believe in our young people and we want them to succeed. Mr Given for a supplement. Can I thank the First Minister for that response and I know um, she will be in uh, Lagan Valley again next month and will be visiting the Resurgum Trust. Uh, that's a, a group which has pioneered educational underachievement um, in terms of a scheme and the Social Investment Fund uh, recently allocated uh, half a million pounds to that uh, uh, scheme that is taking place, particularly targeting uh, those uh, working class Protestant communities. Can I ask the First Minister to assure us that that funding through the Social Investment Fund will be secured in the future and that we won't listen to those parties like the Ulster Unionists who campaigned vociferously against such a fund? 
Well, let me say that I, I do fundamentally believe, and I know there have been some teething problems around uh, the rollout of uh, the Social Investment Fund, but the, the fundamental issue about the Social Investment Fund is that it is making a real and tangible difference, not just to communities, but to individuals right across Northern Ireland. And I'm looking forward to visiting uh, the Resurgent Trust because not only does it fit in uh, with the Delivering Social Change agenda from OFM, DFM, it also points to the Fresh Start Agreement as well, where we want to help those groups uh, to transition into the mainstream of society in Northern Ireland. And I'm very much looking forward, Mr Speaker, uh, to being a part of that visit and to seeing what is actually happening on the ground, the tangible difference that we are making in Lisbon. Thank you. And, uh, <clears throat> congratulations. And that is the end of questions to OFM-DFM.